get in the know. Non-stop Vikings talk. It's Purple Daily on Score North and ScoreNorth.com. Everyone thinks they're going to move on, but I'm like, to whom? Their chance right. to move on is to draft a rookie. They passed on that. I don't think they're going to be in position next year. Maybe I'm wrong. Or maybe they'll they'll put together some kind of godfather deal and just totally, but you know, to get Caleb Williams or whatever, but it seems there's going to be a lot of competition. They're not going to have great ammunition. So then when I look around the league and yeah, there's guys who spring loose every year, but is one, is, I think, is it going to be someone better than Kirk Cousins? I, I find it dubious. It kinds laying the groundwork. You can you can see the extension <laughs> off in the distance. Another year of Kirky Boy. This is Purple Daily. Daily Vikings Entertainment. Phil, Judd, Declan, our executive producer. We have a special guest on the show today. Uh, actually, a guy that's been a friend of the show going back about a decade, going back maybe even longer than that when we used to babble on AM radio every day. Uh, Eric Eager, now the vice president of research, which we'll get to in just a second, um, from Sumer Sports now. But a shout out to our friends at TCL. No matter what you watch, TCL has award-winning TVs for any budget, any space, all with stunning picture quality. And TCL makes more than just TVs. They offer mobile products, audio devices, home appliances. TCL brings you joy and simplicity through innovative technology. Learn more at TCL.com. And boys, a shout out to our friends too at Federated Mutual Insurance Company, Federated's like having a great offensive line for your business. It's all about risk management, protection, looking out on the horizon, and uh, helping you with risks that may pop up as a business owner. And they're also, uh, especially the last few years, really working closely with next generation business owners. So if you're taking over a business from your family, or maybe you're maybe you're rising up in a company and uh, and you're a leader within the company, Federated would love to have a discussion. Federatedinsurance.com, where it's our business to protect yours. Let's bring him in here, the Vice President of Research and Development at Sumer Sports and a longtime friend of the show who used to call in with hot takes to the old Mackie and Judd radio show. He is Eric Eager. Welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I mean, the I, I used to, my first few years at PFF when I was still a math professor, I used to get into the office really early do my PFF work before any of the children knew that I was working on football. And I used to listen to Mackie and Judd. And and honestly, those those years, I feel like when the Vikings were coming up, like 14, 15, 16, those were like far more entertaining at times than like when they're trying to tread water, which is right now. Um, but yeah, I, I remember those years fondly. Those were some, uh, so that, that was Zim's first year. Teddy, his leg blowing up and then case right so like you you were in the midst of the entire uh viking experience i guess would be a fair way to put it yeah i mean growing up you know growing up in maplewood it was like every that i i joke that they, they lost the nfc championship game on my birthday multiple times which is a true fact um <laughs> they you poor they child. um you know but there was it was always and it's funny because you you wonder if Quasey is doing, he's not doing this actually, but like every time they've gotten close, right? So 98, they went, tried to just run it back. Oh uh, nine, they tried to go and run it back. And yep. then 17, the only change was getting a different quarterback, but they mostly tried to run it back the same way. Like, you know, they go 13 and four. I think like not making it deep in the playoffs was helpful for them because it was, it was, you know, not that, you know, they're, they're not trying to run it back, but yeah, you, you've seen this song and dance before, I I'm wondering if this is the first time we're actually going to see them pull back and and look at what had happened and say, Hey, that was a great run, but it's not happening again. So there's a, there's a million places we can go and we'll, and we'll go to as many of them as we can, but just a couple things for the audience. We don't do a lot of guests on purple daily really, but Eric has been, Eric brings such a great analytical perspective. I mean, he, if you haven't followed his work at PFF previously or at Sumer sports, and you can subscribe to the Sumer sports YouTube channel, where you guys are, it's you and Thomas Dimitrov, former general manager, just pumping out all kinds of content. Click the subscribe button on that. But Eric is a driving force in the football analytics uh, community. He is, uh, and, and I know you're probably going to poo-poo this, but he is really one of the, the more forward-thinking presences behind the scenes when it comes to football analytics. So he brings this new perspective to us idiots on this show. 
And when I get a text message from Eric that says, hey, I have a hot Kirk Cousins contract take, we're like, okay, let's do it. Let's bring Eric on so we can uh, sling some hot takes. So let's start with Kirk Cousins. Go ahead, sir. So you guys played the Mina Kimes clip. I, I've come, like, they have put themselves in a position where extending Kirk Cousins, and, and again, yeah, you've had me on. Extending Kirk Cousins is probably their best choice right now. Like, I, and, and I'm not saying it was all set up this way, and I'm not saying that, like, it's a good thing. And, and we do have to back up here because there are plenty of people in the space who are like, well, you guys said, you know, you guys are, are handicapping the Vikings at eight and a half wins because they lost all these players. And what would you have rather them keep? I'm like, no, I would not rather them kept those players. They just had a, they're picking the best of a bunch of bad choices. So like, I, I so, and again, this is probably going to be damning with faint praise, but among all the choices that the Vikings have at quarterback that are realistic, I actually agree with Mina. Like I think extending cousins another year is the best of a bunch of bad choices for them. And their choices, and Mina said it like 100%, like they had a chance to take Malik Willis. Now, I, I think that that, you know, ultimately they're going to they're gonna be uh, proven right there. They had a chance to take Will Levis with their natural pick. They had a chance to take Mac Jones a couple years ago with their natural pick. Like uh, foregoing all these choices has left them in a position where with respect to like job security and with respect to like what their objective is, which is to, you know, be competitive in a really crappy NFC. One more year of Kirk Cousins plus a, like plus this next year to me is probably the best that they can do. And I think that's fine. So what what I what I like that they've done is by not just you know extending Kirk, which by the way the precedent has been three years, right? It's mm-hmm. been oh, here's another three years, here's another three years. It created the opportunity to open the door to look, which I have zero problem with. I think that's smart. Eric, if you're right and they extend him by a year through 2024, I also have no problem with that. What I don't want is another three years. What I don't want is to is to lock yourself in because I do think that part of, and I've been saying this for months now, part of the whole O'Connell experience is to find a young quarterback that he can develop. If you're not in a position to find that guy or draft him, or in your mind, you don't like guys. And I will trust that the current administration led by O'Connell's judgment might pass on quarterbacks they don't like. I think if you extend Kirk by a year, that's absolutely fine. I also think it's smart to look elsewhere. What I don't want is the Spielman experience, which is this feeling of absolute just blind panic that we need Kirk because I don't know what else to do. Yeah, and I think, you know, that was a lot of people wanted the Vikings, myself included, to kind of tear it down last year. I think a benefit of go, of not doing that and winning 13 games, however Mickey Mouse it was, that is that those guys have time. I think the hard part, though, and where they have to be careful and where, like, I talk to them personally, like, when, when you go, you know, you, you say, hey, congratulations on a great year, and they kind of look at you, they're like, it, it, like the the hard part is with teams that have pop up years. We saw it in Kansas City with Scott Pioli. They won ten games. The next, but they it was you know a seven win team fundamentally. The next year expectations go way too high, and then they get, they're all fired by twenty twelve. Like I think that's that's the worry is like they almost tried to. And there's an article on SumerSports.com about sort of the transiency of being above average, but like. They be, they overshot it so much that you you want – I think that they've spent this entire offseason curbing expectations. But what last year bought them was the opportunity to continue to do this. And they're in a situation right now where the NFC is so weak. You look at, you know, obviously their own division. Detroit's favored to win uh, the NFC North for the first time. They're favored to win their division for the first time since 1992. And, you know, Green Bay's down. Chicago, I think, you know, the question is whether they're going to emerge – NFC South is a bunch of teams that are worse than the Vikings. Uh, The NFC West has two teams that are tanking, basically. And then the NFC East has the hardest schedule in all of football. Um, So you you look at that and you're like, okay, in a perfect world, you tear it down and start over. But in the real world, you have to win football games. And the NFC is a is a is a collection of of teams that you can beat with Kirk Cousins as your quarterback. So it, it does kind of change things. They they did buy themselves some time. I, I, I get worried, though, because, again, 
being above average and whether however you measure it, it's such a transient phase in the NFL. Like if they win seven games this year, I would not be surprised at all. And then the question would be like, what were these last two years for? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's it there's that graphic that was put up last week. I think it was like CBS Sports or somebody. And it showed that it was like a ranking of the division championships all time. And of the 10 teams that have won the most division championships, it makes up like 75% of the Lombardi trophies. And the only team that hasn't won one of them is the Vikings. And they're like fourth all time in division championships. So it's, it's this, it's this weird franchise anomaly. And that if you're, I don't believe that football is a sport where you just get in and pray like hockey you have to get in with a construct that makes sense, ideally with a quarterback that can carry you in some certain games. And the Vikings oftentimes haven't had that. But my question for you is, when it comes to what they're trying to do, which is win games on a regular basis and don't ever tank and don't ever settle for like a three-win rebuild situation, can you do that on the fly? I mean, the, the Steelers historically have, and they're changing out, you know, they they've they're on the fly. They're retooling with a new coach 15 years ago, and they find Ben Roethlisberger in the middle of the first round, and now they're doing it again with Pickett. The Chiefs, before Patrick Mahomes, they didn't necessarily tank. They were a playoff team winning 11. Can you do, can you do this on the fly and win a Super Bowl at some point if you don't take that big step back, Eric? I have a, I have a hard time believing you can just because, I mean, you look at the – you look at the Super Bowls since the, the new CBA, you have to judge everything off the new CBA because of kind of the way structures are. 2012 to now, every single Super Bowl except for the Falcons Patriots Super Bowl included a quarterback or a team constructed around a quarterback making rookie money. So the Eagles, you know, had foals, but they it was it was a Wentz constructed team. The Eagles this last year at Hurts. And so that's one way. The other, the quarterbacks besides that who have made the Super Bowl were Peyton Manning. Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes. Mahomes is the first quarterback in the history of the league to win a Super Bowl as a starter, making more than 13% of the cap. He was making 17. By the way, that Chiefs team traded their second best player in the offseason to gain more space and cat and and draft. Hey, picks. You, you know who's making you know who's making less than 13.5% for the first <laughs> time this season? Oh it, it, yeah. turkey so, boy. It, exactly. But you know, the question and, and you're, you're you look back, you look even look at who's playing the conference title games in those years. And it's predominantly the blue chip quarterbacks and teams constructed around quarterbacks making hardly any money. And so it would be an anomaly. Now, I, the, the Vikings, again, the their franchise history has been has been a collection of anomalies that they almost used to win Super Bowls. 2000 or 1998, 2009. 2017 with their 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 uh, defense being so good and so healthy that year, this would be an anomaly. But there are the pieces in place. They have a great offense. Um, you know, Jordan Addison I think will be a, a wonderful number two receiver behind Jefferson. Offensive line for the first time it is projected to be pretty good. The defense is horrendous, but you have defense can regress. You know, back to the mean. Um, you know, just by happenstance alone and some guys you know sort of emerging, especially the positions that Quasi has drafted. So I think that they I think that they can, but it's just such a long shot to me that I just don't know if I if I had my druthers whether or not I would do what they've done. So I think there's confusion here though, because I I keep hearing now that there's a certain segment that believes that the Vikings by purging some of the guys that, that they did from their roster are going to take a step back. I don't agree with that at all. I do think that they're not going to be as good of a team because they won what eight one score games mm -hmm. last year in the in the last quarter, which is not exactly a normal thing. But I really think, Eric, what we're looking at here is really the first true construct of what Quazy and O'Connell want. Like I think we're now going towards what they see. When you bring everybody back from Mike's team. I'm sorry. Quasi seems like far too bright of guy to have said, my idea is let's just run this team back. I still think the will said you're going to do that. Let's see. And then judge, which is at, you know, that's their right. But this whole thing of, and I I've actually heard that there are veterans on the Vikings upset that more guys didn't come back. Like, how could you let this guy go? How could you let mm -hmm. that guy go? Well, you do that because to improve that's absolutely paramount. And guys like, Patrick Peterson and Eric Kendricks are going to regress more. So just to be clear, 
I don't think we're saying that we don't expect the Vikings to be as good in 2023 because of the guys who are gone. I think it's a common sense of how things work in this league that they would take a step back. And I'm all for this becoming crazy in Kevin's team. Oh, for sure. And, and I think that that was what they believed anyway. Like, I think that they looked at that team and said, there was a lot of, you, you, you look at like penalties, like the Vikings were really good on penalties. You looked at the end of halves and like, I have to formalize this better because O'Connell didn't look the best in some of our like timeouts take, but like Kevin O'Connell just kind of worked around the margins better than Mike Zimmer did. Like you think about all those end of half scores that other teams got against the Vikings in 20 and 21, like they just did a better job. And, you know, this is just understanding who Kirk is, right? Kirk is a very good drawer between the lines. He's a terrible artist. So you, you just know that <laughs> Kirk's not going to take the extra 10 seconds off the clock that you need to. So when you score, then there's not enough time left for the other team to come back and equalize you in the end of a half or end of game. And so they just, you know, and to me, actually, like the funniest thing was early in the season, they were having all third down passes go past the sticks to save Kirk from himself. Like all the routes were past the sticks. And when they acquired Hawkinson, it kind of changed. And of course, it ended their season. But they did, a, I think, a really good job last year of just like what the team was, you know, work around that deal with some of the things that Mike didn't do particularly well. And then this year they're finally starting to, you know, put their print on the, on the roster, but make, like, make no mistake. Like the market has them at eight and a half wins. They were at nine and a half last year on the market. So the market expects him to take a step back. And I don't think that that's Quasi's fault. I don't think he's done anything that I would like, he hasn't done things that I would, I was like, Oh, that was stupid. It's just, they had a bunch of difficulties that stretch from trying to win last year and not having a great sort of foundation. And so there, and the crazy part is the way that things shake out, which you can't always predict has meant that I think the cousin one or two more years of cousins is probably what this team needs to sort of bridge the gap because, you know, there aren't that many great options for them. And I don't think that they're going to be bad enough in this NFC to, to be able to get their pick of the litter at quarterback. So it's a very interesting discussion because it, they are probably going to take a step back. I don't necessarily know if that means anything bad about the way that they've done stuff. And they put them, the, the world has sort of painted them in a, in a Kirk Cousins corner again. Eric, what do you uh, view of this whole Dalvin Cook situation? So I, I saw even Albert Breer on Monday morning tweeted that there was a trade that was close to happening with the Dolphins back in March. The Dolphins have cleared more cap space, but then I believe they also drafted a running back. So it seems like the writing on the wall that the Vikings want to move on from Dalvin. They don't necessarily just want to cut him straight up. They want to get some type of draft compensation back, similar to what they did with Zedarius Smith. Uh, I guess two-pronged question. Do you see a trade or a, an incoming move coming on Dalvin Cook? And then the other side would be, is there actually a solution where Dalvin Cook remains with the Vikings in 2023? Yeah, so I... So th this is where I think people kind of misunderstand the June 1st thing because, like, they made it so that now you can designate a person a June 1st cut and you can cut them. But, A, you don't get the caps, the extra cap savings until June 1st, and that's after everybody's been picked over. And furthermore, you can't trade somebody on a June 1st designation, meaning you can agree to a trade, you can do all that, but the cap, like, you can't actually realize the June 1st savings in the cap with a trade that is executed prior to June 1st. So the reason that they were waiting this long was because they wanted the extra cap space and whether they would actually use that cap space or roll it over to the next year it is, is you know, a question. And effectively it's the same thing. In fact, if you do the post June one, you, and this is why, you know, Quasi being kind of a finance guy, you have, you know, that those $3 million are 3 million this year. If you roll them over, they're actually worth less to the cap in the future year. So they're trying to keep that kind of, they're trying to keep that, um, you know, that that optionality there in case there was somebody like a Hawkinson that they had to trade for or whatever. But they can, like Cleveland did last year, roll over those millions. So that's why it hasn't happened yet. The re it hasn't happened yet is not a reason that it won't happen. It's just that there's a lot of other stuff like the Dolphins uh, drafting Devin Akane that can actually like affect the the probabilities and stuff. So I, I think that there is a way he stays. I don't. Players don't really take pay cuts, which you know, that, that will, that will muddy the waters a little bit, but um, unless they really view that $3 million as being something that they can work with next year, um, in addition to what they would save uh, from just cutting him in addition to that, 
Like I, they might just stick with him. I, he wasn't effective last year. If you look at all the metrics, like he was fairly ineffective and he's been going the wrong direction. He has the big plays, but it's sort of like when Adrian Peterson was ending his career, like in 2015, like led the league in rushing a lot of long runs, but a lot of plays that set the offense back negatively in early downs that, that were sort of obscured by the long runs he'd have. So I I think they're better off cutting him, but I could see a situation where he stays Uh, I don't see a situation where he takes a pay cut, but I could be wrong. By the way, uh, just so Barnwell posted this, uh, I think three weeks ago, and Delvin Cook, rush yards over expectation two years ago, plus 250, last year minus 41. So two years, that's a 300-yard difference in uh, in R-Y-O-E, boys. That's R-Y-O-E. And it kind of feels like, in terms of roster construction, It took them a minute because they ran it back last year, but Quasey is looking at, it it appears anyways, premium positions, loading up, pass pass catchers. Justin Jefferson was was on the team when he took the job. Okay, go get a tight end that might be a top five pass catching tight end. Go get the best route running wide receiver in the first round. Boom. Franchise left tackle, franchise right tackle. Um, Marcus Davenport, we'll see if if process can lead to actual results in terms of sacks and, and pressures, they still have Daniel Hunter. So it feels like they're allocating money and resources and draft capital to premium positions. They've stripped away salary from linebacker saying goodbye to Kendricks um, and running back. They're going to wind up stripping it with Dalvin cook and going running back by committee. So it, I don't, is that a good sign that in terms of just like positional importance, the Vikings are getting that in line compared to maybe previous years. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, with now they they got lucky because Spielman drafted all pro left tackle, all pro wide out. Those are premium positions that are are sort of left over. Right tackle is becoming more premium. They have Brian O'Neill there. Edge, you know, they still haven't taken a defensive end higher than the third round since um, I believe it was like Kenechi Udeza or something. It's it's been forever since they've taken a defensive end high. They use the first first rounder on Jared Allen they use a second rounder on Ngakwe but like that would be one where looking ahead if there was actually an edge player that was worth it for them they 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 should go for that but yeah for the most part I mean say they went safety guard in rounds one and two last year which is tricky but this year they certainly they did a good job with it and in fact like Dwayne McBride the running back they took out of UAB is like the perfect running backs don't matter analytics running back a guy who has great metrics and 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 I think will be a pretty good player for this team. So yeah, I think, you know, Quasey's trying to balance things. You know, they, they're, you know, they just got, they just let go of Scott Kuhn, who was the analytics director on a Spielman. Like I think they're transitioning, you know, um, and, and he has got Ryan Grigson with them to sort of help him with the football side. I, I, I think, I think right now to call what they're doing, you know, analytical might be a little bit of a stretch, but I also think that he's doing, what nor what what sort of non analytical GMs are doing a little bit smarter than they are with knowing kind of these rules of thumb like premium positions and, and trades and things like that. So uh, yeah, it, it's it's a, it, it's a good evolution. The question is again like none of it really matters unless they figure out quarterback long term and they don't have that figured out. But it, it it so far is encouraging for them. And I I think the positive though is that they finally have a guy or guys in the building that have a chance like. That was the thing with Zim and Spielman and that crew. You had no faith. Like, who was going to, fit to you know, they take Mond, who was a disaster, but also they didn't know what to do with him. It's like they went and bought this, you know, high-priced quarterback thing, and then they're like, what should we do with it? They, they d- didn't know. Uh, on the Dalvin Cook thing, I think it's an interesting topic because I feel like the Dalvin Cook thing, both locally here, Eric, and nationally, is covering up the more important story, which is the Dalvin Cook thing is going to play itself out. I don't think he's coming back on that contract. So it's either a pay cut, release, or trade. That's fine. The Daniil Hunter thing, though, is barely getting any play here. And he's not at OTAs, which, as we talk about all the time, are optional. But he's not going to play on his current contract. And I feel like that's the story here. Because if you go into opening day with or without Dalvin Cook, okay, whatever. If you go into opening day without Hunter, that's a big, big blow. So I think that the far more important salary cap financial discussion is not Cook, nice player, probably gone. It's Hunter, 
nice player who you really want and need. And right now he ain't going to show up for anything on his current contract. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and their current contract kind of hamstrings them, right? Because, you know, up until June 1st, like he was 18, eight dead because they used void years to sort of spread the money out a little bit. Um, and, but it was very much a, Hey, he's going to either be, he's going to be traded or he's going to be, and, and a trade isn't even like that, you know, because all the money accelerates to the Vikings there. Um, he was, it was a puke point for them. Like that contract made last year, a real big question mark, right? Because you missed 2020 with a neck. You were very good in the first half of 2021, then got injured. You come back. And, and frankly, like he was being outplayed by Zadarius Smith in the first half of the season. And came on and was actually, you know, on balance, probably the better player by the time the season ended. So he's a – and pass rushers tend to, especially the – especially Hunter, who when you look at his tracking data, he, like, doesn't come off the ball as fast as some of these other guys. But late in the rep, he makes very good moves. And that is a – when you look at – and, again, football. This gets down to, like, a little bit of the footballness of it. But, like, guys who win the way that – Yes. Yes. Guys who win the way that Hunter does, which is not necessarily, and he's very athletic, don't get me wrong, but guys who who win not because of their get off, but because of the moves they have mid rep are guys who age better. And so I, I, I think Hunter will be a Viking long term. The question is, is how to deal with it. Like the Wills are very good. They're not like, you know, we talk about you know, the Hunts and the Chiefs and stuff. Like they're fine, like, go, you know, putting money up front to, to help this team, but that's going to be what happens. Like Hunter, everything that, that Hunter would would be owed as a dead cap. The majority of that's already been paid to him. You know, the, the hard part is like he wants new money, and you know, in a and that new money, you know, with respect to this year because of all the void years, is not really going to lower the cap number all that much from 13 down to something palatable unless they they make it a longer term deal. And so that's like the sticky wicket here. A lot of times extensions will help with cap space. But that's because like the, the number was already inflated. This year's number is not inflated because they use void years. And so that's one of the the void years are very good if you're disciplined with them, but they do create this conundrum of extensions don't necessarily the extensions just kind of cap, you know, add, you know, prorated money and stuff like that. So it, it, it's something, but they'll get it done because they have to. They 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 have no choice but to get it done with Hunter. It'll just be interesting to see what that structure is. What is God, there's so much. We, we'd love to just have you on again in like a month and do a part two to this. But um, Moneyball is what launched me into baseball analytics 20 years ago, reading that book by Michael Lewis. Yeah. And, and one of the big themes of that book was market inefficiencies. And at the time in baseball, 20 years ago, it was on base percentage. Batting average was still valued by the old grizzled baseball scouts less than on base percentage. And teams like the A's that locked into, boy, just getting on base and keeping the chains moving, we can actually pay a cheaper price for that than uh, than teams think. So my question to you is right now in 2023, what's the biggest football market inefficiency? The thing that you can acquire the cheapest or however you want to phrase it, um, that teams haven't fully paid attention to or caught on to? Oh, it's, a, it's a great question. Like, I think... Out in the open, it's quarterbacks on rookie deals. I think that some, you know, that it's not properly priced in. Um, to me, though, quarterbacks on rookie deals, the understanding, and this is not true of baseball, weak link versus strong link. So don't, you know, you're. It's best to have the the uh, a fifth player in your secondary that's better than replacement than it is to have like a Daryl Revis type player. Like I think that's being formulated right now. But to me, actually, the the number one hidden inefficiency in the NFL, and no one's talking about this. If you go to the Sumer Sports Show with myself and Thomas Dimitrov, we talked about this um, a couple weeks ago, is teams should be trading draft picks for coaches. So wow. right now, so Denver was able to do this. Now, Denver's owned by the Walton family who has money. The reason, so the reason trading high draft picks for players is risky is the Frank Clark thing. Like I'm, I'm, trading a first and a second if I'm the Chiefs. Now, they won the Super Bowl, so who cares? But, like, I'm trading a first and a second, and then I'm bellying up to the for 50 you know, to 100 million in contract. So the reason that you buy – the reason that draft picks are so valuable is the variance, right? Because I can get a player who – Jamar Chase, who's being paid $5 million, who's worth 30 That's a $25 million surplus. 
And, you know, if I paid Tyree Kill 30 and he's worth 30, that's a zero surplus. You can't win necessarily that way. And Vikings know this 100%. Kirk's either been at the value of his contract or less the entire time and they can't win, even though he's a pretty damn good player. Mm-hmm. But with respect to the cap, you don't, your coach is paid what he's paid. It doesn't matter. So when you use a first or a second round pick on a coach, you're buying the shrinking variance without actually paying much more than the, the draft capital for it. So how, how many current coaches are worth a first round pick right now? So, and, and I know, I know a former executive in the league who actually tried to trade for Sean McVay the last year of his tenure. And they told him to go believe I would make, oh, I would make reckless speculation. I would make the 49ers turn down two first round picks for, for Kevin, uh, for Kyle Shanahan every year. I would make the Rams turn down two first round picks for Sean McVay every year. I would make the Steelers do the same for Tomlin. Although I don't know Tomlin's more of a top down guy where I'm not sure where the value comes from, but it's there and it's a very hard analytical problem. There's a culture building aspect. That's hard to quantify yeah. with him for yes, sure. Exactly. I, I know where Shannon, like I can, I can show you explicitly where Shannon's value is. I can show you explicitly where McVay's value is. I have like Tomlin, donks fourth downs all the time and they still win like i have no idea where it comes from but he's a culture guy um sirianni is on the border sean payton i think that was a fair price for him i think the broncos are gonna make the playoffs this year um that would be a bet that if anybody wants to do uh now that sports betting is about to be elite about to be legal in minnesota hopefully um that that would be one that i would lay lay down on on but that I think there's probably like five guys. Andy Reid is close, but age is a little bit of concern for me. Belichick's age is concerned with me. And I actually, frankly, hot take, don't think that Belichick adds much anymore to the Patriots um, uh, from a game-by-game standpoint. So it'd be McVay, Shanahan, um, and and Peyton, and maybe Reid. I would I would make those teams turn down two first-round picks every year. Is two enough? Two is enough. So you, we can go through the math, but like a, an average coach adds about one. Sorry, an elite coach averages adds about one point two five wins per year to their team, and so then you say how much is a win worth, and then how much does it cost, and then so it, I put it at roughly two middle of the first round picks. Interesting. I love it, dude. That's interesting. Great. That's- hey, I got I got a position that I think to Phil's point, I think that this is the next one too. I think the the between the margins position that's going to emerge, the teams are starting to toy with now, but I think it's going to become commonplace, is safeties who are traditionally not super highly paid except for the like total elite ones, right? Safeties who are put in, in big nickel packages and used as hybrid linebackers. I think that's the next one. I think that... That could be the equivalent of tight ends now, who of course are are receivers, really, but they get paid like tight ends. I think the safety position used as a rover hybrid linebacker is the next um potential position where you could pay a guy like a safety and get way, way more production, at least for the short term. Yeah, I think that that's a decent idea. The 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 thing is a safety is an So great, great point. I think the thing with safety is that they're undervalued because it's very, very difficult to measure their performance. If go to my former employer, go to go look at safety grades year to year. They're the least stable among. So like because they're 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 only graded on like six to ten plays a game. You get so much variance. Like we don't know, and this is where tracking data, the X, Y coordinate stuff, and a lot of the, the lessons from soccer are being deployed. And I don't think well right now. It's like, how much field do you control? If you are so Belichick, I did this project back when I was at PFF, but Belichick used to do a brilliant job of making Stefan Gilmore cover a bigger part of the field than JC Jackson. And so then a quarterback had to decide: do I throw to this big ass part of the field? but at the best player or do I throw out this small part of the field to the worst player? And like Belichick just did a great job of like manipulating space so that like both, that was a pick your poison. Safeties can do a good job with that. The only issue I have Judd is that if you build your team around, if you build the airplane around a player in a weak link system, that, that is the, that is the strong player. So and there's an article on Sumer Sports about this. So it's like Jalen Ramsey. You want to have a secondary where every single player has an equal opportunity of success. 
meaning I want my weakest player having the weakest assignment. I want my best player having the most diverse and difficult assignment. And then the, the probability that the system does well is maximized when everybody has the same likelihood of success. Yeah. My issue is that what happens if that player gets hurt? And you look at the, the Los Angeles Chargers with Derwin James, you look at the, and I look at it on the offensive side with the Niners with George Kittle. Like when your team depends so much on a player like that, and that player gets injured, the whole thing comes crumbling down. And that's where I have a, it's tough because injuries are hard to predict. But if I know that that player's playing 17 games, you're absolutely right. I want that star player who can play in the box deep, can play in the slot, can, you know, all that stuff I, I think is undervalued. The hard part is that right now, and it's just like in baseball, Phil, when, when people were learning about hitting, de measuring defense came second. So before they could measure defense that well, they just assumed it didn't matter that much. Mm -hmm. And I think like a lot of teams now are terrible at measuring how good safeties are. So they just don't simply they simply don't value it in the marketplace. I think when somebody cracks that that you know Rosetta Stone about safeties, they'll be valued more. Yeah. Eric, do you think that the that Brian Flores can coach up this defensive backroom that is pretty much completely unproven or have not played any significant NFL snaps? I mean, I look at Andrew Booth, who I know was banged up. Uh, they're going to obviously ask a ton of Byron Murphy, but with the pass happy nature of the NFL, I just look at NFL teams probably picking on the Vikings defense a ton because they don't have experienced defensive backs. Do you think Flores can coach up a well enough scheme that gets these raw and unproven players to play at a level that has like at least respectable and not being exposed like Leslie Frazier's defense by the end of, of 2012, 2013? Yeah, right, right. Um, I mean, I look at their schedule. You have Hurts, you have Herbert, you have Mahomes, um, you have... You know, but after you get past those games, you know, yeah, Burrow, uh, I think Goff is a pretty good player. Um, I think a lot like last year, the question might be, does it, will it matter that much? Because last year they didn't play great quarterbacks. And so they got a lot of interceptions and stuff. They ended up getting, you know, uh, uh, you know, sort of exposed in the playoffs. But I, I think it'll, I think that he, he has as good of a chance as anybody, but it's tough. I mean, Caleb Evans has a lot of concussions. Andrew Booth is somebody who like no one in the league believes can stay healthy. Um, you know, go down the list. Now they've thrown numbers at corner, which I really like. They've thrown numbers at safety, which I really like. And again, it's an or problem. Like, you know, the Bengals became good because of Chase Higgins and, and Burrow. But on de defense, they signed like seven players, including Trey Waynes, that had like NFL experience. And they just played the best five. And Trey Waynes wasn't one of those best five. Funny. Like, it might be a situation where, like, one of the highly drafted guys the Vikings don't the Vikings had is not one of the best five. But I like the fact they're throwing numbers at it. Man coverage is a weird thing. We wrote about it on, on Sumer the, a, a couple weeks ago. The hard part about man coverage is it, it exacerbates whatever you already were. So I like that they're going to play man coverage against some of these weaker quarterbacks because – I think that the, the if they have an edge, it'll grow. I'm a little worried once they get in the playoffs and they're be, they're man coverage heavy because you're going to be playing great quarterbacks and zone tends to smush the differences between teams. Man tends to enlarge them, so in the playoffs they might get exposed like the Frazier defenses were. I but I think insofar as the regular season, it's a good way to test whether or not the the players the Vikings have drafted are any good. Yeah. Eric Eager, VP of Research and Development at Sumer Sports. Go to that YouTube channel, Sumer Sports, and click subscribe. And yeah, let's let's do it again sometime, like around training camp or something, and we can uh, we can dish some more hot takes. Maybe by then we'll have a two year Kirk Cousins extension we can react to. I mean, imagine being that blessed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how could you not want to sign up for a couple more years oh, like of this guy? I've pulled a complete 180 myself. I am uh, firmly in the tuck your white t-shirt into your elastic sweatpants guy walking around the house. I I mean, I, I can't, I, Seattle had the exact opposite uh, impact on you that I thought. Uh, <laughs> it did. I've seen the light now on Kirk Cousins, wow. apparently. So, Eric, great stuff, man. Thanks for hanging out with us and supporting us. And love what you're doing at Sumer Sports. And we'll see you in the Vikings Twitter trenches. Thanks for having me on, fellas. Take care. Thanks, dear. All right. There he is. Um, by the way, let's shout out a couple friends here, too. Uh, Athletic Greens. So 
Listen, old Macadac, not always the best at getting all the nutrients he needs the uh, the natural way through just like eating the right foods. And that's where Athletic Greens AG1 comes in with nutritional insurance to start your day. 75 high quality ingredients, one scoop mixed with your water in the morning, or you can maybe maybe you do it halfway through the day. Eliminate that brain fog, heighten those energy levels. It helps with my gut health. Personally, if a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash purple daily. That's athleticgreens.com slash purple daily. Um, and Judd, our friends at Finch Home Solutions are helping people around the house. Very they exciting. Do. Yes, and including, and I mean, look at that beautiful van. Cody and his team are going to pull up in that. And yes, they will talk plenty of purple with you if you so desire, because Cody is a huge Vikes fan. But also, you know what? The most important thing in life is knowing what you can do and are good at. And like for me, that's hot sports takes. I love delivering hot sports takes. But you know what I can't do? Fix anything. And when it comes to electronical problems, I can fix nothing. And that's where Finch comes in few months back there was a, a light in my basement out do you think that i was going to say you know what i'm going to find out i'm going to google how to fix this hell no because i didn't want to burn my house down and i knew that finch would fix it <laughs> that's, they that's did. their tagline finch home solutions don't burn, don't burn your house down don't burn your house down don't try this is not a a do-it-yourself or uh, uh uh and finch is going to uh take care of it they did for me they were courteous. They were professional. Probably most importantly in Judd's life, they were quick. They were in and out, and it was fixed. And I want you now to experience from Cody and his team what I did, which is professional help in areas where you definitely should look to the pros. Finch is the pros. FinchHomeSolutions.com, 612-357-2604. FinchHomeSolutions.com. Check them out. And again, if you've got flickering lights, if you've got anything you need fixed, don't do it yourself. Don't be dumb. Finch Home Solutions is there for you. <laughs> oh, I love Judd. You're I'm not going to try and fix anything myself. I'm I know. We heard it. Yeah. We know. I'm know. smarter That's than that. <laughs> oh, man. And then, Dex, tell our audience about the best place for golf simulation, cocktails, and food all in one. It's like putting all your favorite things into oh, one God. giant uh, establishment. Yeah, I can't believe my friend Lucy just made this establishment basically for me. Uh, three Jack in the North <laughs> Loop, okay? And the Patio Burger Series that's coming here. So we, Bill Mackey, Judd, or Mackey, Judd, and myself, we all able to have some nachos, but now they got oh. Burger Series each week in the month oh. of June. A new delicious burger for you at your disposal at one of the best patio spots. And yes, you can get a cold one. You can go swing your golf clubs in the simulator. You can go to 3jack.com. To book that simulator tour and check out those uh, those patio burgers that are coming as well, go to 3jack.com. Yep. Awesome, man. That was um, some great stuff there from our friend Eric Eager. I know some 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 people on Vikings Twitter like to spar with Eric, and he will spar right back. Oh, God, you. yeah. And, uh, yeah, he's been – he was a regular caller into our daily radio show for, for a long time, and now he's legitimately one of, like, the tip of the iceberg uh, – football analytics guys in OG's the industry. now right like i mean mm -hmm. he's he is outstanding what now for what now what word do you use i said he he is an og of that oh. aspect og he is like an original because like the pff thing started it yeah absolutely i mean he helped that he really helped build the backbone of pff and mm -hmm. now they're launching something new here with sumer sports and so thanks for his time today tomorrow so purple daily tomorrow going to be recorded a little bit later because old judd's uh -huh. going to be down with the goggles again ota observations live field tomorrow glasses. afternoon field glasses damn it i don't have Sorry. goggles i have field glasses if you, see if you would, Jefferson. if you could attach them if you had like an elastic thing that they could wrap around go your rambus? head they could be goggles yeah about yeah. say kurt rambus go kurt rambus <laughs> so tomorrow i don't know probably between like 2 2 30 tomorrow afternoon yeah. somewhere in there or I don't know. We'll tell you. We'll let you guys know. But oh, yes, yeah, so Judd will be full of observations from Vikings practice tomorrow. So thank you guys for hanging out with us. This is Daily Vikings Entertainment. Yes, even in June and July. What the hell do you guys talk about? Well, uh -huh. join us every day and find out. It's uh, Purple Daily, Daily Vikings Entertainment, where we just want the Vikings to win a Super Bowl before we die.